All right, um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the two semesters I've spent teaching Rust. Um, just a little bit of background um, at my institution, Rochester Institute of Technology, we've had a series of co-listed bachelor's, master's courses um, that were really set up to, hey, let's introduce a new language or new language paradigm. And so we've had regularly offered instances on Haskell, on modern C++, on C Sharp. Um, so over the past two years, you know, I've been doing an instance of this course, you know, on Rust. Um, and overall, the experience has been quite positive. Uh, I'm thinking that's been the experience of, of most of us here. Um, maybe in a little contrast to Rose's, you know, intro sequence, um, my course, you know, is sort of a best case scenario for teaching Rust in terms of prior experience. Uh, my undergrads are definitely through their entire intro sequence with Pyth semesters of Python, Java, and C plus at least our undergraduate PL course that, you know, kind of surveys things. Um, and for our master's students, they've definitely had, you know, usually some industry experience, you know, or uh, their own undergraduate experience plus semesters in Python and Java. Um, so what I was hoping to spend today doing is telling you a little bit about my course structure, um, a little bit about my favorite lectures that that came out pretty well and, and invite you to, to borrow materials. Um, and a little bit about the programming assignments that I put a lot of effort into because I think that's really the place where students are going to get the most out of the course. Um, and you can see the paper that I wrote up for a qualitative comparison with the Haskell version of the course that I uh, have taught many times because um, I think it's it's an interesting point of comparison of those two languages and language communities too, especially. Um, so uh, we've got a traditional 15 week semester. Uh, the way I've set up this course um, is about the first half uh, spends time following the Rust programming language book pretty, you know, directly um, uh, with, some, some, you know, lectures. And sort of for the second half, we kind of transition to uh, less uh, polished, you know, uh, primary source material. You know, we're going to blogs and videos and, and some research papers. Um, but trying to address you know, a lot of different kinds of advanced you know, topics. And of course, you know, that's the kind of thing that can evolve over time as things come and go out of uh, that realm. Um, something that worked particularly well for, for this course uh, was to include some preparation work, you know, reading ahead of time with uh, some uh, pass, you know, fail, done, not done uh, quiz uh, that kind of got our our discussion started. So I, I got them critically thinking ahead of time um, and we could sort of dive into that you know, during lecture. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about you know, my programming assignments and then the other interesting things that I have them do um, is try their hand at designing you know, a new programming you know, assignment for that first half of the course. Uh, teaching a course for the first time, I didn't have a lot of assignments ready at hand. So that was a good thing to ask students to do. And, uh, another activity to ask them to, to go out and look at some of those advanced topics that we didn't get a chance to in class uh, and, and investigate them on their own and share that in sort of a blog post to the rest of the, the course. Um, there's also an independent team project uh, that students do. Mixed bag, uh, probably the best one that, that came out um, was uh, one uh, pair of students that did uh, an LL1 parser generator in Rust, but otherwise, you know, we get sort of the traditional mix of games and, um, uh, you know, interpreters and, and that kind of thing. Um, so a little bit about, you know, lectures. Um, the traditional, you know, collegiate fair, you know, discussions, Q&A, you know, whiteboard and stuff. Um, so nothing terribly innovative there. But I want to tell you about three lectures that that worked, you know, particularly well, or I think that fill in some gaps, you know, that are out there in the resources that I at least was was using in the course. Um, so the first was on implementing iterators, um, and I think this was a piece that changed significantly from the first time I taught the course to the second, um, because in the first time I taught the course, I had sort of deployed the assignment, you know, where they were asked to implement an iterator for a data structure and people just could not do it. Um, and I realized it's because we did not actually look at one you know, deeply in class um, and looking back at some of the source material, 
um, the simple counter example that's out there in the book in the standard library on uh, documentation, it's really too trivial for people to know how to build it up you know, themselves. Um, so we go through this exercise now of implement you know, an iterator on a simple you know, triple data structure, but at least gets them seeing, hey, there's this thing that works well for the um, immutable borrowing iterator, but fails for the mutable borrow iterator and fails for the um, ownership transfer you know, iterator. Um, and we kind of build that up over time to, to see uh, how to transition from the simple example to, to something that works um, more uh, broadly. Um, and then we also back that up with you know, implementing a, a pre-order iterator uh, for simple binary you know, tree um, where they kind of have to do that mental transition from, well, I used to do a traversal just with recursion um, and an implicit call stack. Uh, now I need an explicit stack um, in the iterator state. And, be, and now with that lecture in hand, um, they were able to go on and do the actual uh, implement your own iterator exercise much more um, uh, simply. Um, another one that, that worked out particularly well was sort of following up on the, the fearless concurrency. Um, for many students, right, this will be the first time that they've seen message passing as a uh, concurrency uh, mechanism. Um, they're kind of used to shared state and they kind of you know, know a little about mutexes and stuff but seeing uh, channels is new to many of them um so we implement this broadcast channel abstraction you know so you have essentially multiple senders multiple receivers uh, but a send is broadcast to, to all the the registered receivers um and that gets us you know using both channels but also um atomic reference counting and in, in mutexes behind the scenes um, we got to talk about what do we want to happen when a receiver you know, goes away? How do we prevent from constantly broadcasting to somebody who's not there anymore? Um, get to observe that we don't need to do anything special uh, on drops. Um, we can handle the disappearance of senders or receivers you know, in the, the send and receive methods. Um, and one interesting thing you know, that, that gets a, a number of the students is that we finish all this and we've done all this message passing and then we look at our code and we see that there's no send bounds anywhere um, and getting them to understand like why is it that within the channel we don't need this but rather it gets impressed upon the channel when it's actually shared between threads um, but not in the channel abstraction itself um, which is an interesting thing for for many students to see um, and so the last you know, lecture that that worked out you know, particularly well um, was something uh, kind of going after unsafe rust because um, we kind of hint at that a lot through the course and, and people are interested in seeing unsafe rust sort of in action. Uh, so we implement this, uh, I call it a gallery abstraction. Uh, it's a place to which you can donate objects um, after which you know, lots of people can look at that object but nobody can touch it, right? So you get back a reference to that object um, but nobody can mutate it anymore. Um, this turns out to be a very simplified version of the typed arena crate, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so in the lecture, you know, what we're able to do is refine it from, you know, the very, you know, a, a simple version of just having, you know, a vector of, of objects uh, to a, a more complicated one that handles various levels of indirection and knowing exactly when we need to do a particular unsafe cast uh, to, to get our lifetimes to work out. Um, and along the way, I'm able to introduce and use the MIRI uh, tool, you know, for checking for undefined behavior. Um, and that kind of, you know, we were able to say, well, look, it's seg faulted here. I wonder what's really going on. And we can run it in a MIRI and get a little bit more information about, well, what happened uh, that led to that seg fault. Um, and we're able to, uh, you know, dive deeper. Okay. So, uh, you know, I won't probably have time to go through all of these assignments so in detail here. There's a lot of details in the, the papers that I put together. Um, but I put a lot of effort into the, the programming assignments because honestly, you know, how do you learn to program? You know, you actually program. You, you can't just sit there and lecture and get it. Um, and one of the things that I found interesting in putting these together is that I found myself very easily adding in these optional, they make them extra credit, they're just, you know, optional, um, challenges um, at the end. And usually they're asking the students to either implement some kind of advanced functionality 
um, or improve the efficiency of a component or invitations to return back to this assignment after we've seen some advanced feature that comes later in the course where now they can incorporate that um, into it. Um, and I think this is very much in the style of Rust. I think yeah, Rust really does emphasize its ability to start with something simple um, and then refine it over time you know, with both advanced features, but also the safety that we're getting from, you know, those guardrails that Bart, you know, mentioned up front, you know, so that, you know, you've got something that works and you go to, to try to make it better, you know, you're not breaking it, you know, in a particularly bad way. Okay. Um, so I'll be really brief to, to, to focus on a couple of these and, and really, you know, I'm, I'm here to invite you to, to steal these and borrow these and, and tell me what you think about them. Uh, so one of our early assignments is to implement a simple stack-based uh, interpreter for this little stack-based mini language called, you know, Birch, completely made, made up. Um, you know, and they're getting some experience, you know, uh, dealing with traits, um, and managing ownership, you know, simple, you know, moving data in and out of uh, these stacks. Um, and they can see some of the overhead of dupli code duplication that hopefully helps them to understand, you know, the idea of, of pushing things off into helper methods and, and using things like error propagation. Um, so the example here kind of, you know, emphasizes, look, for my add, subtract, multiply, divide, your operations, all of them need to pop two numbers off the stack. And it's going to be an error if either of the top two elements aren't numbers, you know, or if there aren't top two elements. Um, so we've moved that off into, you know, a helper method, do the error propagation, you know, to, to kill off our, you know, our execution. Um, one of the challenges that asks them to come back later, because we haven't seen closures yet, is to come back to after we've seen closures. Um, so for instance, you know, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, we really want to pass in the, the higher order function, you know, pass in the, the, the function that says, here's the arithmetic operation that I want you to do. Um, and another interesting thing that, again, I think emphasizes Rust is that we can change our data structure to really reduce, you know, allocations. I don't have time to, to go into the details here, but, you know, with a simple shift of, of going from owned vectors of commands to, uh, slices, you know, were able to reduce the allocation um, of the, the interpreter by you know, orders of magnitude. Um, another interesting one uh, is uh, this doing backtracking, uh, sorry, actually not backtracking, it's using uh, breadth first search with hashing, so it's not using, you know, backtracking, uh, solving simple puzzles. So we introduce you know, a puzzle trait to represent, you know, um, uh, the state of a puzzle and how you can evolve that state. Um, practice you know, using some of our data structures uh, to um, you know implement the the solver. Um, and then some of the challenges that that can be there you know are uh, thinking about. It's very easy to implement this where we clone everything, um, and uh, can we eliminate some of those clone bounds uh, so that we're not um, doing such expensive operations on data. Um, we have one on using tries, um, that simple mapping from, from strings to values. Um, so this is the one that asks them to implement an iterator over this you know, sort of now generalized you know, tree-like structure. Um, and there's some interesting things that come up with them understanding um, how to manipulate this data structure, um, how to implement the iterators on it. Um, for some of the simple operations, I asked them to think about what happens when you implement this with iteration versus what when you implement this with recursion? There's some interesting behaviors where when you make a recursive call, you're sort of getting some borrow checking, you know, a borrow and a return of that borrow automatically from that recursive call that you don't always get, you know, if you do it with, you know, in sort of in place, you know, looping iterator. Um, and this one has a lot of sort of challenges that you can think of um, in terms of trying to minimize allocations again. Uh, going from a simple, you know, sort of lexicographic, you know, iterator to your know, reverse lexicographic iterator as well. Um, and uh, we talk about the entry API that's used for things like the hash map, you know, uh, data structure, and can you implement that, you know, here as well. Um, so I'll just 
slides, the, these last two, one, one is, is getting them to use parallel evaluation to do these little cellular automaton, you know, game of life, you know, kind of thing, but, you know, they have to be a little bit careful to, to minimize, you know, their overheads with some challenges going out there and using things like Rayon, uh, which is a data parallelism library crate um, and, and seeing how that works. Um, and a, a final exercise, you know, on rock, paper, scissors, game server, um, getting them exposure to async await. Um, and, you know, game servers, you'll have all these, you know, moving parts, you know, and they, they're sort of a perfect example of where you'd like to use um, uh, async uh, operations. Um, rock, paper, scissors, as lucky as that they don't get lost in the game logic, uh, right? Um, and uh, one interesting thing from an instructor's point of view is how do you test this? Um, testing you know, asynchronous things is pretty tough. Uh, so I put together a test mode that simulates a whole bunch of players, monitors the input output for conformance with the specification. Um, and so that's able to sort of, you know, help us, the students see what's going on. Um, so like I said, I'm really happy to, to share these things with the, the community. Um, and uh, see you know what people have to to think about that. And uh, let me pull up my you know chat window now because I have that behind the screen. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions or I'll keep my eye on the chat. Yeah, large projects. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, with respect to, to this workshop, um, I'll admit that I have not seen as impressive projects from students, you know, that the sort of final team project as um, I might have hoped. Um, again, and I've given them, you know, full, you know, 15 weeks of learning, um, you know, Rust. Um, and so with respect to, to some of these ideas of embedding Rust in other courses, you know, the operating systems course or the compilers, you know, course, um, at least from my observation, you'd really need to, to, you know, give students a lot of the infrastructure. I think, you know, for the team projects, you know, they're starting from nothing and they're kind of building everything. And so they've got the design stuff as well as the writing code. Um, so I think, you know, figuring out how to support them um, because if they're learning the language, well, also trying to learn this other domain, you know, that's really the focus of the course, you know, it's interesting. Um, things that have gone, um, you know, Rayon, um, we get speed up. I mean, we, because I'm, I'm really just asking students to do it on their own, you know, machines, we're getting, you know, around, you know, a two and a half, you know, X speed up on four cores. Um, it doesn't scale too much more beyond that. Um, like I said, the the overheads and there's some necessary synchronizations, um, you know, that that prevent us from getting too much, you know, beyond that. Um, what has gone less well? Um, so, you know, the things that haven't gone great um, is, you know, I don't have any silver bullet for teaching uh, ownership. Um, it's just something that I feel like we have to come back to over and over again through the course um, and kind of emphasize, you know, where it, it arises again, especially in API design. I think that's the place that I, I emphasize a lot. I didn't really get a chance to put it back into the slides, you know, or back into the paper, but one other thing that does sometimes get me teaching the language is that while there are a lot of great ergonomic decisions, you know, in Rust to, to make things simpler or make common cases, it sometimes hides, you know, a bit of what's going on behind the scenes. And, and you know, initially that's what students need to see. Um, and I've occasionally wished that I could sort of turn off some of these, you know, ergonomic uh, decisions um, so that they were forced to write out the more verbose thing. Um, and because it's very easy to go far thinking that you've got one understanding because that's the syntax that's constantly being accepted, but it's really hiding something you know going on behind the scenes. Um, as particularly with you know, you know, Max mentioned lifetime elision. The other thing that I find really hard to do is 
for whatever reasons, ownership as a static analysis seems to be characterized more by what it doesn't accept than by what it does accept. Whereas I think, you know, with our type systems, we kind of like, oh yeah, I want to accept that. I want to accept that. Um, and so whenever I'm showing and even, you know, other code, you know, examples, tutorials, it's constantly code littered with, well, if you uncomment the following line, you'll get this error. Um, and that's never checked. Um, and, you know, I wish there were a better way of conveying that. 